Hello, and welcome to Storytelling Live. What's been going on with you? Have you seen it? Like it. Have you seen, well, well, our world's kind of opening up here in California, right? For you, maybe? People in my circles are making plans. People, friends of mine, calling me up. What's going on? Where have you been? Let's catch up. How have you been? Where are you? How are you? Wow. It's amazing. I mean, the thing that's weird is how the... And forgive me, I don't, it, it's just, um, I happen to also not just watch the news, but I also watch uh, the stock market, and it's been falling. So I thought, you know, there's going to be, I thought, I thought, you know, it might be a bellwether for the resurgence of everything's in the air. No, it's springtime, people coming out, and there's just a lot of meeting and grouping and travel and plans and everything, and it's very... It's not showing up in the stock market. Maybe it's showing up in the uh, stores or something. I don't know. How are you guys? I'm working on the yard. I am putting up garden lights. I had people over last night, almost out of the blue. Hey, let's come over and we're going to write a song. We're going to come over, write a song, and it was... And then they pulled out some whiskey, and I'm like, what? what? Okay. Twist my arm a little bit. You know? I mean, sweet drinks, you know? Mm. Stay up late, 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 late. Late, 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 the quiet night, and there's a fog, see fog, see fog tonight, too. Fog from the sea. Thick, slow, moves slow. And it has a tranquilizing effect, actually, on the neighborhood. It not only soaks up the noise, but it... It um, makes people drowsy, and they turn in early, and the lights go out in the neighborhood. I look out my windows, and the lights blink out. It's so peaceful. So peaceful. I'm working hard. Are you working hard on things? I'm sure we're all like working really hard, but still making plans. This is our life right now. <sighs> um, in case you didn't see the title of tonight's video, uh, tonight is uh, Polidori's uh, Vampire. Again, we've been all over this, this series. Um, you know, <clears throat> and uh, it was written at the same time that uh, uh, Mary Shelley was writing Frankenstein, which is how we started the year. You know? And, um, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm planning the final uh, weeks of this podcast. And thought, I'd, I think I might have picked one and you know, I felt a little tear well up, you know. And, um, but I'm so glad that we don't have to do this anymore. You guys are going to be out and running wild. And you should run wild. And you should run with the people you love the most. And if they, it's not them, then you find new people to love the most. Find new loves. And love them with every shred that you have. My friend, one of my friends made a public post on the social media that I read today. And she feels her social circle is shrinking. Or it's leaning away. People she believed in are reporting that they got the jab of the 5G lemonade. <clears throat> and they're so happy and they're so proud. And why don't you do it? And etc. And she believes it's... It's just trash, and she feels bad for it. And we're making decisions, and whatever your decision is, please don't, don't, 
don't be divisive about it. Let people just make their own mind up for what they want to do. Because we, we're going to be living together for the rest of our lives. And your friends should still be their, your friends, no matter which way they, they've chosen. So that's my little two cents on the vax. Colombia is in unrest. And my Latino friends are just, well, my, my mother and her brothers were born in Colombia. So. And I'm a Colombian or Latino American. This affects us, but this affects us all, the human race. Because, uh, you know, it was like a May Day parade kind of thing, you know, a union parade. I don't think it happened on May Day. I did it happen on May 1st. I forget when it happened. And, um, and then the cops tried to quell it, and that didn't work because the protesters resisted, and so the um, army was called in, and now it's a government sponsored killing. When a government turns against its own citizens, this is a hellish situation. We've seen the results of that in other countries. We don't know what to do yet. We could protest in the streets, but how to stop a government from killing its own people? Firing their army shooter bang bang guns and weapons with fiery trails that kill people on their own cities on their own streets on their own people on their own children that doesn't solve a problem anywhere how does that solve anything where's the where's the logic Anyway, current events. You don't come here to hear current events. Ah, gonna miss you. Thank you for being here. It's another cold read tonight. I've been, and I'm actually recording it late, late at night, late in the week, after a busy day. After many meetings and deadlines, deadlines met, however, we're doing okay. Hope you guys are doing okay. All right, tonight is the vampire, uh, and here's a little bit from the Wikipedia article. The Vampire is a short work of prose fiction written in 1819 by John William Polidori taken from the story Lloyd, Lord Byron told as a part of a contest among Polidori, Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, and Percy Shelley. The same contest produced the novel Frankenstein of the Mar Prometheus. Remember, this was at Diodati, uh, adjacent to Lake Geneva in, was it 1819 or 1816? Um, I think it was 1816. The same contest produced the novel, blah, blah, and the vampire is often viewed as the progenitor of the whole entire romantic vampire genre of fantasy fiction. The work is described as the first story successfully to fuse, to fuse, to successfully fuse the disparate elements of vampirism into a coherent literary genre. We might lapse into the faux English accent again, and if you're a fan of it, enjoy. If not, you might as well find somebody who will read the vampire in an English accent, in, a, in an American accent. Oh, I don't know. These are written in, um, I mean, if it was written in French, I would read it to you in French, right? But it was written in the Queen's English. So why not read it in the, in the why not read it aloud in the approximation of the Queen's English so we could 
get down to the to the mood of it a little bit better. So because I'm reading this, because I read Frankenstein earlier in the year, you know, I'm going out with this, and then I'm going to read The Castle of Otranto. Oh, it's a long one, so I'm going to read... Uh, psh, psh, psh. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There, 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 there. I'm going to read like from chapter five to the end because you, you understand, uh, you know, it's a Horace Walpole in the, in the, uh, eight, in the uh, 18th century. It's uh, probably the very first, um, uh, romantic, gothic, uh, scary, ghosty story that was written that might have started everything. Um, why, again, if you're asking why I'm here, why I'm doing this, I'm not only doing this, I'm doing ghosts, stories about ghosts, stories about monsters. Ghosts is Castle of Otranto. Monsters would be the vampire. And stories about detectives. And uh, if you were here last week, or if you would care to, you know, switch to any of the other videos that I have uh, presented on this channel, um, then you'll see that I'm into ghosts, monsters, and detectives. This is the, uh, the uh, root of uh, almost, you know, all all modern literature has this at the root. You know. um, and uh, what do I like about these um, uh, romantic uh, stories? Well, the vampire, the monster is the misunderstood, the other, that we must, you know, uh, this is about, these are stories about, um, there are sociological backgrounds and rationales and allegories in these stories, simply put. Also, I like a spooky haunted house or I like a, you know, funky tale like this because they come from the darkest depths of the, of the imagination, the stormy side of the imagination, the nightmare, <clears throat> the nightmarish side of the imagination. And to me, well, a storm in the sky brings richness and rain to the land. Lightning, water. I mean, of course, it could destroy the land as well, but storms in dreams, nightmares, which is, would be a nightmare, like a, an electrical storm in the brain, is a dream. I think of a nightmare as a storm in itself. I guess that's sort of poetic, but nightmares to me are rich, rich resources of imagination. Um, and that to me is extremely fascinating. I think that people wake up from, sometimes from beautiful dreams being extremely inspired, but also that people can wake up from a nightmare being like incredibly inspired. Life changed. Maybe. 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 It's just a theory. I like them. I like it. I have had dreams when I'm sure, or even been awake, when I'm sure something is in the room with me. Or when I'm half asleep and I can't move and that kind of thing. And it's scary as hell when it happens, but I know that it's like, it's something in the creativity is sort of shaking loose. And man, that could spin out in so many cool ways, you know? So these stories touch on the nightmarish aspect of the dream, which is, uh, to me, a very powerful sort of electrical storm of creativity that actually seems destructive but nourishes the land of the human mind. That was, that was crazy. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to say that. And I haven't read this, you know, all the way through, so I'm not 
quite sure how we'll be getting through it. It seems to be very nice with a lot of uh, description and hardly any dialogue except for a few declarations and it seems to be pretty smooth pretty 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 smooth very nice and uh, uh, there's a there's writing before it there's writing after it but I just snipped the part that said the vampire because I mean I gotta keep it down to like 90 minutes YouTube doesn't like this most of the people flying around YouTube don't like this you know they're in for three four minutes poof 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 you know and then you're gone <laughs> so this vodcast is very much against all known YouTube wisdom because I keep you hostage <laughs> for about what 90 minutes right mmm I invite you to sew during this. I invite you to not look at my face, perhaps just listen to this. I invite you to think of it as a radio show. I invite you to think up a creative way to enjoy listening to this story. Because it's entertaining. And you will not, I'm playing with my big glass of water over here. You will not regret spending a little bit of time with us over here at Storytelling Live. The Vampire. It happened that in the midst of the dissipations attendant upon a London winter, there appeared at the various parties of the leaders of the ton, a nobleman more remarkable for, singu for his singularities than his rank. He gazed upon the mirth around him as if he could not participate therein. Apparently, the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention, that he might look, that he might by a look quell it, and throw fear into those breasts where thoughtlessness reigned. Those who felt this sensation of awe could not explain whence it arose. Some attributed it to the, gray, the dead gray eye, which, fixing upon the object's face, did not seem to penetrate, and at one glance to pierce through the inner, inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek with a leaden ray that weighed upon the skin it could not pass. His peculiarities caused him to be invited in every house. All wished to see him, and those who had been accustomed to the violent excitement now felt the weight of ennui, <clears throat> and now felt the weight of ennui, were pleased at having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gained a warmer tint, either from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion, though its form and outline were beautiful. Many of the female hunters of after notoriety attempted to win his attentions and gain at least some marks of what they might term affection. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster show in, in drawing rooms since her marriage, threw herself his way and did all but and did all but put on the dress of a mountebank to attract his notice, though in vain, when she stood before him, though his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, it still seemed as if they were unperceived. Even her unappalled impudence was baffled, and she left the field. But though the common adulteress could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him, uh, yet such was the apparent caution with which he spoke to, to the virtuous wife and the innocent daughter, that few knew he ever addressed himself to females. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue, and whether it was that, he, that it even overcame the dread of a singular character, or that they were moved by his apparent hatred of vice, 
He was as often among these those females who formed the boast of their sex from their domestic virtues as among those who sully it by their vices. About the same time there came to London a young gentleman of the name of Aubrey. He was an orphan, left with an only sister in the possession of a great wealth, by parents who died while he was yet in childhood, left also to himself by guardians, who thought it their duty to merely to take care of his fortune, while they re relinquished the more important charge of his mind to take care of the mercenary subalterns. He cultivated more his imagination than his judgment. He had thence that high romantic feeling of honor and candor which daily ruins so many milliners' apprentices. He believed all to sympathize with virtue, and thought that uh, vice was thrown in by providence, merely for the picturesque effect of uh, the scene, as we see in romances. He thought that the misery of a cottage merely consisted in the vesting clothes, which were as warm, but were... Um, better adapted to the painter's eye by the regular folds and various colored patches. He thought, in fine, that the dreams of poets were the realities of life. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For these reasons, upon entering into these gay circles, many mothers surrounded him, striving which should describe with least truth their languishing or romping favorites. The daughters at the same time, by their brightening countenances when he approached, and by their sparkling eyes when he opened his lips, soon led him into false notions of his talents and his merit. Attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding that, except in the tallow and wax candles that flickered, not from the presence of a ghost, but from want of snuffing, there was no foundation in real life, for not from the presence of, uh, there was no foundation in real life for any of those congeries of pleasing pictures and descriptions contained in those volumes from which he had formed his study. Finding, however, some compensation in his gratified vanity, he was about to relinquish his dreams when the extraordinary being we have above described crossed him in his career. And that's the vampire. And the vampire, uh, this is a side note here, me talking. The vampire seems a lot like the cats from uh, Twilight, right? Or Twilight? Yeah. Yeah. Pale, gaunt, beautiful, not very turned on by anything at all. So, this young rich man meets the vampire. He watched him, and the very impossibility of forming an idea of the character of a man entirely absorbed in himself, who gave few other signs of his observation of external objects than the tacit asset to their existence, implied by the avoidance of their contact, allowing his imagination to picture everything that flattered his propensity to extravagant, extravagant ideas. He soon formed this object into the hero of a romance, and determined to observe the offspring of his fancy rather than the person before him. He became acquainted with him, paid him attention, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognized. He gradually learnt that Lord Ruthven's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found from the notes of preparation in Blank Street that he was about to travel. Desiring, desirous of gaining some information respecting this singular character, who till now had only whetted his curiosity, he hinted to his guardians that it was uh, time for him to perform the tour, for which, which for many generations had been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice, towards putting themselves upon an equality with the aged, and not account allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies, whenever uh, scandalous intrigues are mentioned as the subject of pleasantry or praise. According to the degree of skill shown in carrying, carrying them on, they consulted, they consented, and Aubrey, immediately mentioning his intentions to Lord Rutherford, was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him. Flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who apparently had nothing in common with other men, he gladly accepted it, and in a few days, they had passed the circling waters. Hitherto, Aubrey had no opportunity of studying Lord Ruthven's character. 
Now he found that, though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results offered different conclusions from the uh, apparent motives to his conduct. To his conduct, his companion was profuse in his liberality. The idle, the vagabond, the beggar received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants. But Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtuous, reduced to indigence by the misfortunes attendant upon even virtue, even upon virtue, that he'd bestowed his alms. These were sent from the door with hardly suppressed sneers, but when the profligate came to ask something, not to relieve his wants, but to allow him to wallow in his lust or to sink him still deeper in his iniquity, he was sent away with rich charity. This was, however, attributed to him by the greater import importunity of the vicious, which generally prevails over the retiring bashfulness of the virtuous indigent. There was one circumstance about the charity of his lordship, which was still more impressed upon his mind. All upon those, all those upon whom it was bestowed, and inevitably found that there was a curse upon it, for they were all either led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and most abject misery. <clears throat> at Brussels and at other towns through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness with which his companion sought for the centers of all fashionable vice. There he entered into this, all the spirit of the pharaoh table. He betted and always gambled with success, except when the known sharper was his antagonist, and he lost even more than he gained. But it was always with the same unchanging face with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however so, when he encountered the rash, youthful novice, the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractedness of mind was laid aside, and his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of a cat, whilst dallying with the half-dead mouse. In every town he left the formerly affluent youth torn from the circle he adorned, cursing in the solitude of a dungeon. The fate that had drawn him, with him within the reach was fiend. Whilst many a father sat frantic amidst the speaking looks of mute, hungry children without a single farthing of his late immense wealth, wherewith to buy even sufficient to satisfy the present craving, yet he took no money from the gambling table, but immediately lost to the ruiner of many the last gilder he had just snatched from the convulsive grasp of the innocent, this might be the result of a certain degree of knowledge which was not, however, capable of combating the cunning of the more experienced. Aubrey often wished to represent this to his friend, and beg him to resign that charity and pleasure which proved the ruin of all, and did not tend to his own profit, but he delayed it for each day, he hoped his friend would give him some opportunity of speaking frankly and openly to him. However, this never occurred. Lord Ruthven, in his carriage and amidst the various wild and rich scenes of nature, was always the same. His eyes spoke less than his lip. And though his aubrey was near the object of his curiosity, he get, uh, obtained no greater satisfaction from it than the constant excitement of vainly wishing to break that mystery, which to his exalted imagination began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. They soon arrived at Rome, and Aubrey, for a time, lost sight of his companion. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess whilst he went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city. While he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. The latter astonished him. If it had before entered into his imagination that there was an evil power resident in his companion, these seemed to give him sufficient reason for the belief. 
His guardians insisted upon his immediately re leaving his friend and urged that his character was dreadfully vicious for that the possession of, <clears throat> of irresistible powers of sedu seduction rendered his licentious habits more dangerous to society. It had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred of her character, but that he had acquired to enhance his gratification that the, his victim, the part of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest, ab the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation. In fine, that all those females who he had sought, apparently on account of their virtue, had, since his departure, thrown even the mask aside, and had not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze. Aubrey, determined upon leaving one whose character had not sh yet shown a single bright point on which to rest the eye, he resolved to invent some plausible pretext for abandoning him altogether, purposing, in the meanwhile, to watch him more closely, and to let no slight circumstances pass by unnoticed. <coughs> he entered into the same circle, and soon perceived that his lordship was endeavouring to work upon the inexperience of the daughter of the lady whose house he chiefly frequented. In Italy, it is seldom that an unmarried female is met with in society. He was therefore obliged to carry on his plans in secret, but Aubrey's eye followed him in all his windings, and soon found that an, ass an assignation had been appointed, which would most likely end in the ruin of an innocent, though thoughtless girl. Losing no time, he entered the apartment of Lord Ruthven, and abruptly asked him his intentions with respect to the lady, informing him at the same time that he was aware of his being about to meet her that very night. Lord Ruthven answered that his intentions were such as he supposed all would have been upon such an occasion, and upon being pressed whether he intended to marry her, merely laughed. Aubrey retired, and immediately writing a note to say that from the moment he must decline accompanying from that from that moment he must decline accompanying his lordship in the remainder of the proposed tour, he ordered a servant to seek other apartments, and calling upon the mother of the lady, informed her of all he knew, not only with regard to her daughter, but also concerning the character of his lordship. The assignation was prevented. Lord Ruthven, next day, merely sent his servant to notify his complete assent to a separation, but did not hint any suspicion of his plans having been foiled by Aubrey's interposition. Having left Rome, Aubrey directed his steps toward Greece, and, crossing the peninsula, soon found himself at Athens. He then fixed his residence in the house of a Greek, and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that apparently ashamed of chronicling the deeds of the freemen only. Only before slaves had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil or so many colored lichen. Under the same roof as himself existed a being so beautiful and delicate that she might have formed a model for a painter wishing to portray on canvas the promised hope of the faithful of Mohammed's paradise save that her eyes spoke too much mind for any one to think she could belong to those who had no souls. As she danced upon the plain, or tripped along the mountain's side, one would have thought the gazelle a poor type of beauties. For who would have exchanged her eye, apparently the eye of animated nature, for that sleepy, luxurious look of the animal suited, but to the taste? of an epicure. The light step of Ianth of Ianthe often accompanied Aubrey in his search after antiquities, and often would the unconscious girl, engaged in the pursuit of the cashmere butterfly, show the whole beauty of her form, floating, as it were, upon the wind, to the eager gaze of him forgot the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost effaced tablet in contemplation of her sylph-like figure. Often would her <clears throat> traces falling as she flitted around 
exhibit in the sun's ray such delicately brilliant and swiftly fading hues, it might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary, who let escape from his mind the very object he had before thought of vital importance to the proper interpretation of the passage of the Pausanias. But why attempt to describe charms which all feel, but none can appreciate? It was innocence, youth, and beauty, unaffected by crowded drawing rooms and stifling balls. While he drew those remains of which he would have wished to preserve a memorial for his future hours, she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil, and tracing the scenes of her native place. She would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain, would paint to him in all the glowing colors of youthful manly. The marriage pomp she remembered viewing in her infancy, and then turning to subjects that had evidently made a greater impression upon her mind. She would tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse. Her earnestness and apparent belief of what she narrated excited the interest even of Aubrey, and often as she told him the tale of the living vampire who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties forced every year by feeding upon the life of a lovely female to prolong his existence for the ensuing months his blood his blood would run cold while he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies but ianthe cited to him the names of old men who had at last detected one living among themselves after several of their near relatives and children had been found marked with the stamp of the fiend's appetite. And when she found him so incredulous, she begged him, she begged of him to believe her, for it had been remarked that those who had dared to question upon their, uh, question their existence always had some proof given, which obliged them with grief and heartbreaking to confess it was true. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters, and his horror was increased by hearing a pretty accurate description of his dear old Lord Ruthman. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears, though at the same time he wondered at the many coincidences, which had all tended to excite the belief in the supernatural power of Lord Ruthven. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to Ianthe, her innocence, so contrasted with all the affected virtues of the women among whom he had sought for his vision of romance, won his heart while he ridiculed the idea of a young man of English habits marrying an uneducated Greek girl Still, he found himself more and more attached to the almost fairy form before him. He would tear himself at times from her, and forming a plan for some antiquarian research, he would depart, determined not to return until his object was attained. He always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him, while in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone, the rightful possessor of his thoughts. Ianthe was unconscious of his love, and was ever the same frank, infantile being he had first known. She always seemed to part from him with reluctance, but it was because she had no longer any one with whom she could visit her favorite haunts, while her guardian was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time. She had appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires, and they both, with several present, affirmed their existence, pale with horror at the very name. Soon after, soon after, Aubrey determined to proceed upon one of his excursions, which was to detain him for a few hours. And when they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged him not to return at night, as he must necessarily pass through a wood where no Greek would ever remain after the day had closed upon any consideration. They described it as the resort of the vampires in their nocturnal orgies and denounced 
The most heavy evils is impending upon him who dared to cross their path. Aubrey made light of the representations and tried to laugh them out of the idea. But when he saw them shudder at his daring, thus to mock a superior infernal power, the very name of which apparently made their blood freeze, he was silent. Next morning, Aubrey set off on his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host, and was concerned to find that his words, mocking the belief of these horrible fiends, had inspired them with such terror. When he was about to depart, Ianthe came to the side of his horse, and earnestly begged, him, begged of him to return, ere night allowed the power of these beings to be put in action. He promised. He was, however, so occupied in his research that he did not perceive that daylight would soon end, and that in the horizon there was one of those specks which, in the more warmer climates, so rapidly gather into a tremendous mass and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed for his delay, but it was too late. Twilight in these southern climates is almost unknown. Immediately the sun sets, night begins, and ere he had advanced far, the power of the storm was above. Its echoing thunders had scarcely an interval of rest. Its thick, heavy rain forced its way through the canoping, canopying foliage, while the blue forked lightning seemed to fall and radiate at his very feet. Suddenly his horse took fright and he was carried with dreadful rapidity through the entangled forest. The animal, at last, through fatigue, stopped, and he found, by the glare of the lightning, that he was in the neighborhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself up from the masses of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting, he approached, hoping to find someone to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to obtain shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached, the thunders, for a moment silent, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling with the stifled, exultant, exultant mockery of a laugh. Continued in one almost unbroken sound. He was startled, but roused by the thunder, which again rolled over his head, he, with a sudden effort, forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. The sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived, for though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact someone who he immediately seized when a voice cried again baffled to which a loud laugh succeeded and he felt himself grappled by one whose strength seemed superhuman determined to sell his life as dearly as he could he struggled but it was in vain he was lifted from his feet and hurled with enormous force against the ground his enemy threw himself upon him, and kneeling upon his breast, had placed his hands upon his throat. When the glare of many torches penetrating through the hole that gave light in the day disturbed him, he instantly rose, and leaving his prey, rushed through the door, and in a moment the crashing of the branches as it broke through the wood was no longer heard. The storm was now still, and Aubrey incapable of moving, was soon heard by those without. They entered. The light of their torches fell upon the mud walls. The thatch loaded on every individual straw with heavy flakes of soot. At the desire of Aubrey, they searched for her who had attracted him by her cries. 
It was again left in darkness. But what was his horror? When the light of the torches once more burst upon him to perceive, to perceive the airy form of his fair conductress brought in a lifeless corpse. He shut his eyes, hoping that it was but a, but a vision arising from his disturbed imagination, but he again saw the same form when he unclosed them, stretched by his side. There was no color upon her cheek, not even upon her lip, yet there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were marks of the teeth, having opened the vein. To this the men pointed, crying, simultaneously struck with horror, A vampire! A vampire! The litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey was laid by the side of her who had lately been to him the object of so many bright and fairy visions now fallen with the flower of life that had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were. His mind was benumbed. He seemed to shun reflection and take refuge in vacancy. He held almost unconsciously in his hand a naked dagger of a particular construction which had been found in the hut. They were soon met by different parties who had been engaged in search of her whom a mother had missed. Their lamentable cries as they approached the city forewarned the parents of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible, but when they ascertained the cause of their child's death, they looked at Aubrey and pointed to the corpse. They were inconsolable. Both died and brokenhearted. <clears throat> Aubrey, being put to bed, was seized with the most violent fever and was often delirious. In these intervals he would call upon Lord Ruthven and upon Ianthe. By some unaccountable combination he seemed to beg of his former companion to spare the being he loved. At the other times he would imprecate maledictions upon his head and curse him as her destroyer. Lord Ruthven chanced at this time to arrive at Athens, and from whatever motive, Upon hearing the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and became his constant attendant. When the latter recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled at the sight of him whose image he had now combined with that of a vampire. But Lord Ruthven, by his uh, kind words, implying almost repentance for the fault that had caused their separation, and still more by the attention, anxiety, and care for which he showed, soon reconciled him to his presence. His lordship seemed quite changed. He no longer appeared, the, that apathetic being who had so astonished Aubrey. But as soon as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired to the same state of mind, and Aubrey perceived no difference from the former man, except that at times he was surprised to meet his gaze fixedly, fixed intently upon him with a smile of malicious exultation playing upon his lips. He knew not why, but this smile haunted him. During the last stage of the invalid's recovery, Lord Ruthven was apparently engaged in watching the tideless waves raised by the cool of the breeze, or in marking the progress of those orbs, circling like our world, the moveless sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. Aubrey's mind, by his by this shock, was much weakened, and that elasticity of spirit which had once so distinguished him now seemed to have fled for ever. He was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Ruthven, but much as he wished for solitude, his mind could not find it in the neighborhood of Athens. If he sought it among uh, amidst the ruins he had formerly frequented, Ianthe's form stood by his side. If he sought it in the woods, her light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood in quest of a modest violet, and then suddenly turning around would show to his wild imagination her pale face and wounded throat with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly scenes, every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind 
who had proposed to Lord Ruthven, to whom he held himself bound by the tender care he had taken of him during his illness, that they should visit those parts of Greece neither had yet seen. They travelled in every direction, and sought every spot to which a recollection could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed not to heed what they gazed upon. They heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to slight these reports, which they imagined were only the invention of individuals whose interest it was to excite the generosity of those whom they defended from pretended strangers and dangers. In, con in consequence of no thus neglecting the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they traveled with only a few guards, more to serve as guides than as defense. Upon entering, however, a narrow defile, at the bottom of which was the bed of a torrent, which large ma with large masses of rock brought down from the neighboring precipices, they had reason to repent their negligence. Scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads and by the echoed report of several guns. In an instant, their guards had left them, and placing themselves behind rocks, had begun fire in direction whence the report came. Lord Ruthman and Aubrey, imitating their example, <clears throat> retired for a moment behind the sheltering turn of the defile. But ashamed of being thus detained by a foe, who with insulting shouts bade them advance, and being exposed to unresisting slaughter, if any of the robbers should climb above and take them in the rear, they determined at once to rush forward in search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock when Lord Ruthven received a shot in the shoulder, which brought him to the ground. Aubrey hastened to his assistance. In no longer heeding contest or his own pale peril, he was soon surprised by seeing the robbers' faces around him. His guards, having upon Lord Ruthven's being wounded, immediately threw up their arms and surrendered. By promises of great reward, Aubrey soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to a neighboring cabin. And having agreed upon a ransom, he was no more disturbed by the presence, they being content merely to guard the entrance till their comrades should return with the promised sum, for which he had an order. Lord Ruthven's strength rapidly decreased, and two days' mortification ensued, and death seemed advancing with hasty steps. His conduct and his appearance had not changed. He seemed as unconscious of pain as he had been of the objects about him. But toward the close of the last evening, his mind became apparently uneasy, and his eye, often fixed upon Aubrey, who was induced to offer his assistance with more than usual earnestness, assist me. You may save me. You may do more than that. I mean, not my life. I heed the death of my existence as little as that of the passing day. But you may save my honor, your friend's honor. How? Tell me how I would do anything, replied Aubrey. I need but little. My life ebbs apace. I cannot explain the whole, but if you would conceal all you know of me, my honor were free from stain in the world's mouth, and if my death were unknown for some time in England, I, I, but life, it shall not be known, swear, cried the dying man, raising himself with exalted violence, swear, by all your soul reveres it all, by all your nature feet, by all your nature fears, swear that for a year and a day that you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way, whatever may happen, or whatever you may see. His eyes seemed bursting from their sockets. Uh, I swear! said Aubrey, he sunk, laughing upon his pillow, and breathed no more. Aubrey retired to rest, but did not sleep. 
The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with this man rose upon his mind, and he knew not why, when he remembered his oath, the cold shivering came over him. As if from a presentiment of something horrible awaiting him, rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel in which he had left the corpse. When a robber met him and informed him that it was no longer there, having been conveyed by himself and comrades upon his retiring to the pinnacle of a neighboring mount, according to a promise they had given his lordship that it should be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon that rose after his death, Aubrey astonished, and taking several other men, determined to go and bury it upon the spot where it lay. But when he had mounted to the summit, he found no trace of either the corpse or the clothes, though the robbers swore they pointed out the identical rock on which they had laid the body. For time, this mind was bewildered in conjectures, but at last he turned. He, he at last he at last returned, convincing, convinced that they had buried the corpse with sacred clothes. Weary of a country in which he had spent such, weary of a country in which he had met with such terrible misfortunes, and in which all apparently conspired to heighten that superstitious melancholy that had seized upon his mind, he resolved to leave it, and soon arrived at Smyrna while waiting for a vessel to convey him to Otranto or to Naples. He occupied himself in arranging these effects with he had with him belonging to Lord Ruthven. Amongst other things, there was a case containing several weapons of offense, more or less adapted to ensure the death of the victim. There were several daggers and atagons. While turning them over and examining their curious forms, he what was his surprise at finding a sheath, apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut? He shuddered. Hastening to gain further proof, he found the weapon, and his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped. <coughs> the sheath he found in his ha that he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger, yet he wished to disbelieve. But the particular form, the same varying tints upon the haft and the, and the sheath, were alike in the splendor on both, and left no room for doubt they were also, there were also, drops of blood on each. He left Smyrna, and on his way home at Rome. His first inquiries were concerning the lady he had attempted to snatch from Lord Ruthven's seductive arts. Her parents were in distress, their fortune ruined, and she had not been heard of since the departure of his lordship. Aubrey's mind became almost broken under so many repeated horrors. He was afraid that this lady had fallen a victim to the, to the destroyer of Ianthe. He became morose and silent. His only occupation consisted in urging the speed of the postillions, as if he were going to save the life of some one he held dear. He arrived at Calais, a breeze, which seemed obedient to his will, soon wafted him to the English shores, and he hastened to the mansion of his father's, and there, for a moment, appeared to lose in the embraces and caresses of his sister all memory of the past, if she before by her infantine caresses, had gained his affection. Now that woman began to appear, now that the woman began to appear, she was still more attaching as a companion. Miss Aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing-room assembly. There was none of that light brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded heart. Her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath. There was a melancholy there was a melancholy charm about which it did not seem to rise from misfortune, but from some feeling within that appear, that appeared to indicate a soul conscious of a bright realm. Her step was not that light footed which strays wherever a butterfly or colour may attract. It was a sedate and pensive. When alone her face was never brightened by the smile of joy, 
but when her brother breathed to her his affection and would in her presence forget those griefs she knew destroyed his rest who would have exchanged her smile for that of the voluptuary it seemed as if those eyes that face were them plain in the light of their own native sphere she was yet only eighteen and had not been presented to the world it having been thought by her guardians more fit that her presentation should be delayed to her until her brother's return to the continent that he might be her protector it was now therefore resolved that the next drawing-room which was fast approaching should be the epoch of her entry into the busy scene aubrey would rather have remained in the mansion of his fathers <clears throat> and fed upon the melancholy which overpowered him. <clears throat> he could not feel interest about the frivolities of fashionable strangers when his mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed. But he determined to sacrifice his own comfort to the, comfort, to the protection of his sister. They soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day, which had been announced as the drawing room. The crowd was excessive, the drawing room had not been held for a long time, and all who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty had hastened thither. Aubrey was there with his sister. While he was standing in a corner by himself, heedless of all around him, engaged in the resemblance of that the first time he had seen Lord Ruthven was in that very place, he felt himself suddenly seized by the arm. And a voice he recognized too well sounded in his ear. Remember your oath. He had hardly courage to turn, fearful of seeing a spectre that would blast him, when he perceived at a little distance the same figure which had attracted his notice upon the spot on his <clears throat> first entry into society. He gazed to his limbs, almost refusing to bear their weight. He was obliged to take the arm of a friend. The force of a passage through the crowd, he threw himself into his carriage and was driven home. He paced the room with hurried steps and fixed his hands upon his head. As if he were afraid his thoughts were bursting from his brain, Lord Ruthven again before him. Circumstances started up in a dreadful way. The dagger, his oath, he roused himself. He could not believe it possible. The dead rise again. He thought his imagination had conjured up the image his mind was resting on. It was impossible that it could be real. He determined, therefore, to go again into society. But for though he attempted to ask, cons for though he attempted to ask concerning Lord Ruffin, the name hung upon his lips, and he could not succeed in gaining information. He went a few nights after with his sister to the assembly of a near relation. Leaving her under the protection of a matron, he retired into a recess, and there he gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts. Perceiving at last that many were leaving, he roused himself, and entering another room, found his sister surrounded by several, apparently in earnest conversation. He attempted to pass and get near her, but when one whom he requested to move, turned around and revealed to him those features he most abhorred. He sprang forward, seized his sister's arm, and with hurried step forced her toward the street. At the door he found himself impeded by the crowd of servants who were waiting for their lords, and while he was engaged in passing them, he again heard that voice whisper close to him. Remember. Oh, he did not dare to turn, but hurrying his sister soon reached home. Aubrey became almost distracted. If before his mind had been absorbed by one subject, how much more completely was it engrossed now that the certainty of the monsters living again pressed upon his thoughts? His sister's intentions were now unheeded, and it was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her what had caused his abrupt conduct. 
He only uttered a few words, and those terrified her. The more he thought, the more he was bewildered. His oath startled him. Was he then to allow this monster to roam, bearing ruin upon his breath, amidst all he held dear, and not avert its progress? His very sister might have been touched by him. But even if he were to break his oath and disclo disclose his suspicions, who would believe him? He thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch, but death, he remembered, had already been marked. For days he remained in his state, shut up in his room. He saw no one, and ate only when his sister came, who, with eyes streaming with tears, besought him for her sake to support nature. At last, no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude, he left his house, roamed from street to street, anxious to fly that image which haunted him. His dress became neglected, and he wandered, as often exposed to the noonday sun as to the midnight damps. He was no longer to be recognized. At first he returned with the evening to the house, but at last he laid him down to rest wherever fatigue overtook him. His sister, anxious for his safety, employed people to follow him, but they were soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than any from thought. His conduct, however, suddenly changed. Struck with the idea that he left by his absence the whole of his friends, with a, friend, with a fiend amongst them, of whose presence they were unconscious, he determined to enter again into society and watch him closely, anxious to forewarn, in spite of his oath, all whom, were load, all whom Lord Ruthven approached with intimacy. But when he entered into a room, his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking, his inward shuddering so visible, that his sister was at last obliged to beg of him to abstain from seeking for her sake a society which affected him so strongly. When, however, remonstrance proved, remonstrance proved unavailing, the guardians thought proper to interpose, and fearing that his mind was becoming alienated, they thought it high time to resume to resume again that trust which had been therefore imposed upon them by armed parents. Desirous of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings, and of preventing him from exposing to the general eye those marks of what they considered folly, they engaged a physician to reside in the house and take constant care of him. He hardly appeared to notice it. So completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject. His incoherence became at last so great that he was confined to his chamber. There he would often lie for days, incapable of being roused. He had become emaciated. His eyes had attained a glassy luster. The only sign of affection recollection remaining displayed itself upon the entry of his sister. And then he would sometimes start and seize in her hands with looks that severely afflicted her. He would desire her to not touch him. Oh, do not touch him. If your love for me is aught, do not go near him. When, however, she inquired to whom he referred, his only answer was, True, true. And again, he sank into a state whence not even she could rouse him. This lasted many months. Gradually, however, as the year was passing, his incoherences became less frequent. His mind threw off a portion of its gloom, while his guardians observed that several times in a day he would count upon his fingers a definite number of and then smile. The time had nearly elapsed, when, upon the last day of the year, one of his guardians, entering his room, began to converse with his physician upon the melancholy circumstances of Aubrey's being in so awful a situation when his sister was going next day to be married. Instantly, Aubrey's attention was attracted. He asked anxiously to whom 
glad of this mark of returning of the returning intellect of which they feared he had been deprived, they mentioned the name of the Earl of Marsden, thinking this was a young Earl whom he had met with in society. Aubrey seemed pleased and astonished them still more by his expressing his intention to be present at the nuptials and desiring to see his sister. But they answered not. But in a few minutes, his sister was with him. She was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of her lovely smile. For he pressed her to his breast and kissed her cheek, wet with tears flowing at the thought of her brother's being once more alive to the feelings of affection. He began to speak with all his wonted warmth, and to congratulate her upon the marriage with a person so distinguished for rank and every accomplishment, when he suddenly perceived the locket upon her breast. <clears throat> Opening it. What was a surprise at beholding the features of the monster who had so long influenced his life? He seized the portrait in a paroxysm of rage and trampled it underfoot. Upon her asking him why he thus destroyed the resemblance of her future husband, he looked as if he did not understand her. Then, seizing her hands and gazing on her with a frantic expression of countenance, he bade her swear that she would never wed this monster for he but he could not advance it seemed as if that voice again bade him remember his oath he turned suddenly round thinking lord ruthven was near and saw no one in the meantime the guardians and the physician who had heard the whole and thought this was but a return of his disorder entered and forcing him from miss aubrey desired her to leave him, fell upon his knees to them. He implored, him, he begged of them to delay but for one day. They, attributing this to the insanity they imagined had taken possession of his mind, endeavored to pacify him. They retired. Lord Ruthven had called the morning after at the drawing room, and had been refused with everyone else. When he heard of Aubrey's ill health, he readily understood himself to be the cause of it. But when he learned that he was deemed insane, his exultation and pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained this information. He hastened to the house of his former companion, and by constant attendance and the pretense of great affection for the brother and the interest in his fate, he cratched the one ear of Miss Aubrey. Who could resist his power? His tongue had dangers and toils to account. Could speak of himself as, uh, as of an individual, having no sympathy with uh, any being of a crowded earth, save with her to whom he addressed himself. He could tell how, since he knew her, his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation, if it were merely that he might listen to her soothing accents. In fine, he knew so well how to use the serpent's art, or such was will of fate that he gained her affections. The title of the elder branch failing at length to him, he obtained an important embassy, which served as an excuse for hastening the marriage, in spite of her brother's deranged state which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent. Aubrey, when he was left by the physician and his guardians, attempted to bribe the servant, attempted to bribe the servants, but in vain. He asked for pen and paper. It was given him. He wrote a letter to his sister, conjuring her, as she valued her own happiness, her own honor, and the honor of those now in the grave, who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of the house to delay but for a few hours that marriage on which he denounced the most heavy curses. The servants promised they would deliver it, but giving it to the physician, he thought it better not to harass any more the mind of Miss Aubrey by what he considered the ravings of a maniac. Night passed on without the rest to, busy, to the busy inmates of the house, and Aubrey heard with a horror that many more easily be conceived, that may 
with a horror that may more easily be conceived than described. The notes of busy preparation. Morning came. The sound of the carriages broke upon his ear. Aubrey grew almost frantic. The curiosity of the servants at last overcame the vigilance. They gradually stole away, leaving him in the custody of a helpless old woman. He seized the opportunity with one bound, was out of the room, and in a moment found himself in the apartment where all were nearly assembled. Lord Ruthven was the first to perceive him. He immediately approached and said, but, uh, and taking his arm by force, I hurried him from the room. Speak to this with rage. With, when on the staircase, Lord Ruthven whispered in his ear, Remember your oath, and know, if not my bride today, your sister is dishonored. Women are frail. So saying, he pushed him towards his attendants, who, roused by the old woman, had come in search of him. Aubrey could no longer support himself. His rage, not finding vent, had broken a blood vessel, and he was conveyed to bed. This was not mentioned to his sister, who was not present when he entered, as the physician was afraid of agitating her. The marriage was solemnized, and the bride and bridegroom left London. Aubrey's weakness increased. The effusion of blood produced symptoms of the near approach of death. He desired his sister's guardians might be called, and when the midnight hour had struck, he related composedly what the reader has perused. He died immediately after. The guardians hastened to protect Miss Aubrey, but when they arrived, it was too late. Lord Ruthven had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire. Wow. Well, there you have it. I'm up super late. This is later than usual. It's not the time that you're watching now. It's different. I'm tired. Maybe you're tired. It's a lot of monologue. And, you know, reading it through now with you. <clears throat> and I'm sure there are purists who would, you know, argue with me. But I dare say Mary Shelley's writing is a lot clearer and a lot cooler and a lot just more beautiful. Um, this was, this is actually kind of, uh, it was like 18, 19, you know, man. Uh, it's very, uh, it's actually Polidori. I don't know how much other, uh, you know, I don't know what else he wrote, you know. But, this, I mean, basically, let's call the writing basic. Let's call it, uh, not quite primitive, but really, it's rudimentary writing. Uh, there's not a whole lot of <clears throat> set dressing character. Well, there, there are sets of characters. I don't know, I'm thinking about what we just heard. There's not a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of telling, not showing. It's basic. <clears throat> and, um, you know, Mary Shelley's writing is really beautiful. Really beautiful. And I don't, you know, she was what's... What was she? She was like 16 when she started? Coming from this fabulous family, Polidori probably as well. Um, I just think her writing is so much better. Oh, I'm tired. So we got a few more weeks. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you watched this. <clears throat> um, I'll see you next week. And, you know, just a few more, and we're out. And um, I'll try to have a nice little 
episode, final episode for you. Should be fun. Should be really fun. Oh, it's super late here. So that's why you're getting me this way. <sighs> okay. Thank you very much. Hope you like my bow tie. Right. And um, have a wonderful evening. And take care of yourselves. And be be very warm and healthy. And have a great time out there. In the real world, in the non-COVID world, keep your eye and bear witness to what's going on in Colombia. All right. Thank you. Good night.